Welcome to a lecture on imaging patterns and pathology in carotid CTA. My name is Dr. Shabel Saadi. I'm a radiographer with more than 20 years experience. I have a master's degree in CT and MRI as well as a PhD in contrast media. I've published more than 100 original papers and more than 70 abstracts presented at the large international meetings, such as ECR, RSNA, Arab Health. Also, I'm an adjunct professor of medical imaging in numerous universities around the world, and mdct.com.au has always been at the forefront for education, and more importantly, give back to the industry, because we always teach you what others don't. This is a disclaimer. Please pause your slide, read it, and once you've moved on, you have accepted it. So we're going to look through this lecture on aneurysms, ulcerated plaques, dissections. Also, we're going to go into places where people are not mentioning much about fibromuscular dysplasia. We'll see the effects of stroke, arterial venous malformation, and of course oncology. Whilst we are doing carotid CTA, oncology has a big role in angiographic imaging. One important slide to remember, plaque features such as the presence of soft plaque, ulcerations or increased common carotid artery wall thickness seen on CTA are strongly and positively associated with cerebrovascular ischemic events, and that the presence of calcified plaque is negatively associated with prior ischemic events. Now, just a little bit more information. CTA allows us to classify the type of plaque as if it's fatty, which is soft plaque with a density value less than 50 Hounsford units, mixed density, which is between 50 and 119 Hounsford units, and of course anything above 120 Hounsford units is classified as calcified. Now let's take a look at some cases of aneurysms in the cervical thoracic as well as in the cervical and intracranial circulation. So if we take a look here at these three images, the image to your left is a 3D reconstruction which demonstrates the actual aneurysm that is coming off the internal carotid artery as well as the image in the middle demonstrates the same image however with bone removal and this is where you have kinking of the left internal carotid artery which you can actually see this with more than 180 degree flexion or fold over which is demonstrated by the red arrow and of course the image to the right demonstrates exactly what we see in the first image to your left which is a surgical photo of the large aneurysm. This next case also demonstrates a true saccular aneurysm of the left internal carotid artery and in combination with severe carotid artery stenosis, where you can see with the white arrow. Aneurysm is characterized by clear external contours, which you can see with the red arrow, and three-dimensional reconstruction of this image, as you can see in the sagittal MPR. Now, more importantly, you can also have pre-stenotic and post-stenotic dilation, which then further characterizes this as well. Here this is another image where, again, this is at the carotid bifurcation where we actually see the comparison of CTA and surgical results where you have a false aneurysm of the right common carotid artery which you can see with the white circle on the image to your left. The defect of the wall of the artery confirmed during operation as you can actually see with the middle surgical photo and the black arrow. And the last image to the right is after surgery with the actual angiogram, the actual false aneurysm has completely resolved and it is back to being normal. 
Now let's just take another closer look about how pseudoaneurysms occur relative to the normal artery. So the blood vessel as we know has a tunica intima, a tunica media and a tunica adventitia which is the external surrounding. And also we have vasorum, which is blood vessels that supply the actual blood vessel itself wall. Now if you had a pseudoaneurysm what actually occurs is that the tunica adventitia does not actually split or um, dissect. It will actually, the media and the intima will tear and it will cause a large outpouch. Now radiologically we can see the difference between a normal aneurysm versus a pseudoaneurysm. So if we take a look at these two images here. The first image, which is A, as you can see, this is a, tra a traumatic carotid artery pseudoaneurysm. Now, this actually demonstrates irregularity of the left common carotid artery, as you can actually see with the two white arrows, or the arrow heads, after the stab wound to the neck, and then you can actually see the left internal jugular vein, which is the actual black thin arrow, which is also being injured. Now note that there is paralysis of the left vocal cord, which you can see with the white arrow, which is because the vagus nerve, because there is a vagus nerve injury. Now, if you look at the sagittal curve reconstruction, again, in the carotid artery, as you can see, inferiorly with the two white arrow heads, you can actually see that pseudoaneurysm. You have a bulging that's coming out, but again, it is, has not taken the entire vessel. This next case demonstrates a pseudoaneurysm of the right internal carotid artery. As you can see to the image to your left, this is a 3D volume rendered image of the large pseudoaneurysm, which is in an asterisk, as well as you have a kinking in the proximal aneurysm, where you can actually see this with the black arrow. Whereas the image to the right is a curved NPR, where they've actually taken the entire vessel and stretched it all out all the way up into the cavernous sinus superiorly and you can actually start to see the neck of the aneurysm is about 30 millimeters now if this was a true aneurysm you would not have a straight vessel you would also secondly you would not have this mixed heterogeneous filling of contrast now importantly the contrast hasn't filled up properly as well so that means if it was a true aneurysm you would have a lot more flow and density of contrast in there. However, in this case, it's very s slow and heterogeneous. Again, this is another case, as you can see in, in the image to your left, or also denoted as A. This is a pseudoaneurysm happening at the internal carotid artery. And again, you can actually see on the axial CT enhanced carotid CTA. Now let's talk about ulcerated plaques. Now just a little bit more information. Fatty plaques we know are below 60 Hounsford units. Mixed plaques can be between 60 and 130 and we know that calcified plaques are greater than 120 Hounsford units. Now in this slide here as well, it's really important to understand that a lot of plaques like to occur at the area where there is the slowest amount of flow of blood Secondly, if these vessels are under a lot of pressure. So these plaque usually happen in and around the carotid sinus. Now plaque size, again, they always like to look at the maximal length versus the maximal thickness. We also like to distinguish between plaques. Is it homogeneous or heterogeneous? We also look at the Hounsford unit, which we've talked about it, and we also provide a region of interest. Also, we need to look at the plaque morphology. Is it smooth? Is it irregular or is it ulcerated? Now, if it is ulcerated, is identified, there are different types of ulcerations. And then also they need to have bi-dimensional internal ulceration measurements, as you can see in the fifth box down or the fifth rectangle. And the very last, are there more plaques distally or proximal to the bifurcation? These are called tandem lesions. So these tandem lesions are not connected to the original lesion, but they're separate, but they are superior or inferior. So let's take a look at this case now. The image 
here demonstrates five images. The one to your left is a 3D volume reconstruction. The one next to it, which is the second to your left, is the actual maximum intensity projection thick MIP. The one in the center or the last one on the right in terms of it's a curved MPR. And then the top on the far right is an axial image. And of course, the one at the bottom is also a map which is looking at iodine mapping. Now, if we look here between these three reconstructions, you can actually see where the red arrow is. It's an ulcerated plaque at the carotid bifurcation. Now also, but more importantly, the axial images demonstrate the degree of stenosis and ulceration. And also it shows the composition of the plaque. So as you can see here with the internal carotid artery, you can actually see that there is a, a low density plaque. It looks like it's less than 50 Hz foot unit. So it's like lipid based plaque. And you can actually see this with the red arrow quite nicely, which has also caused further pushing onto the actual external luminal wall, which is then caused a stenosis. This next image here also is a series of images where you actually have an ulcerated plaque and you can actually see in the axial images from the superior, middle and inferior. You can see that the plaque wall is smooth. However, it could be also irregular, irregulated or it could be ulcerated surface. So when you're looking at one slice, you can't necessarily make one image. You need to look at a series of slices because you could also change at that particular slice what the ulceration and the wall looks like. And the images to your right also is a 3D volume rendered of the Circle of Willis, which demonstrates two aneurysms which were not actually a part of the actual sequences. When we we're looking at the carotid CTA, they were just more worried about the actual ulcerated plaque. However, they actually showed that even you have these tandem aneurysms as well, which are seen. Here's another case here. The image to your left is a 3D volume rendered. And then the image above is above the stenosis. And the image below is at the level of the stenosis. Now, as you can see here, this is a 67-year-old patient with severe stenosis of the left internal carotid artery. Now, usually what happens is, as we said before, you'll get a stenosis. As you can see with the white arrow head, which is the image below, we can actually see this plaque, which is very low density, almost like fat. And then also the wall is almost irregular. And then what happens is when you have a stenosis and a plaque above the stenosis, you can also get dilation. Here is another case example of a 62-year-old patient with a near occlusion of the left internal carotid artery, as you can see here with the white open arrow, which is to your right that is smaller compared to the right internal carotid artery, which is the white arrow. And, and also it is very different. And you can actually see this is where 3D volume rendering begins to miss the information because it could be small, subtle filling of contrast, but the software has not been able to pick it up. And then as you can see with these axial images between left side and the right side, the left side shows this very small vessel that has been completely blocked due to this plaque. Now let's take a look at carotid dissection. Again, it's the same anatomy as we showed before, but if you have a dissection, it's a tear of the intima. And the tear of the intima then creates a channel or a false lumen where the active blood, which is in the true lumen, which is being pumped out by the heart, will pass through this intimal tear and it will create its own false lumen. Now, interestingly, these false lumen, two things can happen. Either they could stay active and it could be an inlet and an outlet. So the tear could start somewhere and then it could open up somewhere else. Or the blood that goes in there becomes very slow moving and then it can actually become thrombotic. So if we take a look here, this is a typical example of a dissection. You can actually see the 3D schematic images on your left. But if you look at the image to your right and the top one, which is the ultrasound, you can actually see the intimal tear and you can see the large area is the actual true lumen. 
and the false area is the smaller area. If you look at the same patient below, you can actually see contrast is filled in the true lumen, whereas the lumen that is not filled with contrast, but it's very slow, is the false lumen. But sometimes contrast mixing can actually fool us because it's not necessarily the contrast can be in the true lumen. Sometimes the contrast can also be in the false lumen. So what happens here is if you look at the angle of the lumen which meets the vessel wall, if it's less than 90 degrees, then definitely that is actually the false lumen. And if it's more than 90 degrees, then it's going to be the true lumen. So this is another case of a 63 year old man. You can see images from A to C where A is a CTA, B and C is a conventional angiogram which show an arterial dissection because you can actually see the slow filling of the left internal carotid artery. Image D is after the procedure where they actually implanted a stent which is a white double arrow head, you can see that. And as well as a second one where they put in a, which is the black one, which is also about 12 to 13% overlap when they did the angiogram because they, actually, they could actually see on the angiogram that it was an active dissection. So the false lumen will only get bigger and bigger and then all of a sudden it will explode. So therefore they had to put a bilateral stent with about 15% overlap in order to close off that lumen so then no blood can escape from the true lumen to the false lumen. Now let's take a look at some infections. Now just a little bit more information about infections. Infections in the head and neck can result in cervical adenitis, inflammatory change of the deep cervical lymph nodes, and the most common cause of adenitis is a viral infection of the upper respiratory tract, However, there is a broad differential, including bacterial infection, tuberculosis, and of course, HIV. So let's take a look at this case here. This is a large suppurative lymph node. The patient has presented with fever, sore throat and cough, and had a palpable left neck mass. On the axial CT, you can actually see there is enhancement of the deep cervical lymph node, which is actually seen by the white star. The internal carotid artery is next to it, as well as the draining veins. And then if you can look at image B, you can actually see that on the opposite side, you can see equal filling between the arteries and veins. However, it's not only until you actually produce a sagittal view to actually look at the actual extent of the effect of the internal carotid artery relative to the actual lymph node. And you can actually see that there is a preserved planes in the normal carotid space. And of course, you know, if you look at this, you can see this fluid tracking from the lymph node rupture. So you can also have lymph nodes that can rupture. And this happened post-surgical as we saw in image B. Now we'll talk about fibromuscular dysplasia. And we did mention this before in the sensitivity and specificity section of this CTA lecture series. So if you have a look at type 1, this is where fibromuscular dysplasia, the muscular component of the wall or the tunica media, actually loses its elastin and it starts to almost kind of compress on top of each other. So type 1, you actually get these bulbular compressions or a bead appearance. Type 2 is almost looking like a stenosis. And then type 3 is a complete combination of both and collapse. So if you look at this sagittal curved NPR of the internal carotid artery, you can actually see the multiple bulbs collapsing on top of each other. This is a typical type 1 fibromuscular dysplasia. Here is another case also. You can actually see this is another type 1 fibromuscular dysplasia. It's actually seen higher up with the open arrowhead. You can actually see this compressed bead-like appearance but it's a lot smaller and subtler when they went and performed a DSA as you can see the image to the right you can actually see it quite nicely now let's talk about stroke but we're not talking about stroke itself of what happens in the brain we're going to talk about the stenosis the plaques and how blood flow actually moves 
in the carotid and vertebral system to see what effect on why is it sending up thrombosis into the brain. So if you have a look here at the normal carotid artery, you have the internal carotid and the external carotid, and there are multiple branches. Here we have what they call is the carotid artery web. This is where you have a fibrous tissue, which is actually coming off, and it gives you some flow turbulence. And then also, if you had a cholesterol plaque, this is due to atherosclerosis. But what's important here is this. This altered flow of blood coming into the internal carotid artery can start to cause reduced flow. Anything that has reduced flow then can increase the level of thrombin, which can then cause further blood clot formation, which can then end up further up in the brain. So if we have a look at this here, you can actually see the actual carotid arteries or carotid web. And this patient kept having recurrent ischemic strokes. Now this line here, you think to yourself in the yellow arrows on the DSA and then the white arrow at the sagittal NPR and 3D volume, you think to yourself, oh, this looks like a dissection. But the problem is it's smooth walled and it's almost like one flap in the middle of space and there's a little bulge coming out. Now, what happens here is this, this fibrotic area becomes so much thickened because it's fibrotic, it starts to alter the blood flow and then causes blood clots further up. So in order to fix this, they would put a carotid stent. And by the way, this likes to occur at the level of the bifurcation. So here we'll just take a look at these images here between A, B, C and D. If you were to have a fibrous cap, what happens here is you get thrombus formation at Cobb's web and in any movement or turbulent flow due to increased blood pressure, it can actually move it or push it off and then the clot will go up into the brain and give that patient um, thrombosis or blockage of the middle cerebellar artery. So this is the reason why when we're imaging carotid CT, we need to make sure we get optimal enhancement of the carotid arteries. When you scan from top to bottom, you've given time for the contrast to fill in to these little small spaces and these small blood vessels in the carotid and vertebral system. Also, when you're scanning from the top down, as you're scanning in the pure arterial phase, the venous system filling behind you is rushing behind you, but it's not contaminating our image. So what's happening here is this. When we scan from craniocaudal, we're allowing the pathology, we're allowing the contrast to fill the pathology, we're allowing to get the wall or the enhancement of the wall, we're allowing to see if there's any enhancement of the plaques, we're allowing to see all the pathology a lot clearer because we have a completely filled vascular tree. Now the carotid web may be an important cause of ischemic stroke in patients with otherwise no determined mechanism of stroke and may present a high risk of recurrent stroke, as we saw in the few cases before. Now, intimal variants of fibromuscular disease may be the pathologic diagnosis in most cases as well, because again, you start to get altered blood flow. And the prevalence of carotid web in both the general and stroke population is low, and the optimal management still remains unknown. However, based on experience, they actually like to use stents. Now let's talk about arterial venous malformations. Here you can actually see a complete cirsoid aneurysm. It is quite large. You can actually see pure arterial phase filling up into the system between the internal and external carotid arteries and going up into the superficial temporal artery. As you can see, especially better on the MIP, and then, then you see this large nidus, which is this large area or ball of spaghetti appearance. Now, importantly, if you were to do an AVM imaging, instead of looking at the arterial time to peak, you would actually put your peak at the internal jugular vein. Because once the contrast reaches the internal jugular vein, that means it's filled the arterial system, it's filled the nidus as well as the AVM, and then it's coming back down into the venous system. So this is where you most of the time you should do your monitoring bolus is in the level of C4 and it always scan from top to bottom as well. Here is another case, a well again, 
which demonstrates a large AVM outside the brain and you can actually see the arterial and venous filling system. Now this really helps surgeons quite a lot because normally with AVMs you can't go straight to surgery and have this cut out. You'd need to go to interventional radiology that will embolize those large vessels which they use a glue. They don't need to use those coils uh, that have cotton in them or just use a normal onyx glue. And then once they bring that down and they actually can completely necrotize the AVM or the nidus of the AVM, then they'll go into surgery, remove that nidus and then do further reconstruction. And here is another view of a patient and you can also get areas of aneurysm. So you need to be careful to make sure we got optimal filling. And again, level of C4, I will do my monitoring at the internal jugular vein and once it reaches the peak bilaterally, then I'll scan always from top to bottom. This next case here is quite interesting actually. This is a four or five year old patient where they had a large AVM and it was actually going into the mandible and it actually eroded the bone as well. So as you can see here, the image to your left, you can actually see there is a large vascular network. You can see arterial and venous phase filling. And also you can actually see in the right mandible, especially at the angle of the mandible, there is complete bone destruction. And you can carry this through in the 3D volume rendering, as you can see on the second image to your left and in the image, the first image after that. And in the last image on your right, you can actually see the conventional angiogram, the external carotid artery, which is supplying that AVM. Now we'll touch on for tumors for carotid CTA. So if you have a carotid body paraganglioma, they usually like to occur at the carotid bifurcation. What happens here is you have a vascular mass which will displace the internal carotid and external carotid. But more importantly, the external carotid gets pushed out anteriorly, whereas the internal carotid gets pushed back posteriorly laterally. The location is usually at the bi bi carotid bifurcation. It's usually unilateral, but in 5 to 10% of the time, it can be bilateral, and this is very common. The size can vary between 1 to 6 centimeters. By that time, you get a palpable mass. You find difficulties in swelling. Then you'll come in and look for this. And then, of course, you know, depending on the level of the tumor, now this is key. If you have circumferential contact of the tumor with the internal carotid artery, then you have a surgical classification. If it's type 1, that means it's less than 180 degrees where the tumor has completely encapsulated around the vessel. If it's between 180 but less than 270, this is a type 2 and a type 3, which almost becomes non-surgical and they would have to do a bypass if it's greater than 270 degrees. Now, this is a typical example. You can actually see here, this is an internal carotid artery. So it's the right internal carotid artery where you can actually see the complete filling of the actual tumor. But more importantly, you can actually see the vascular movement and you can actually see the soft tissue difference between the lesion and the vessel wall. So this is a delicate operation but with the major vessels, this is going to be quite easy to remove. And displaying this information is very important, not only in the axial plane, but you do a curved NPR. Also, you need to do 3D volume reconstruction just to show the extent of it. Again, here is another case of paraganglioma. You can actually see there's anterior and posterior lateral movement of the ICA and ECA. So the image to your left, you can actually see on the left side of the patient. Then you have another one here, the image to your right. You can actually see on the right side of the patient, there is posterior lateral movement of the ICA and the ECA is posterior anteriorly moved. And also you get this rich full bodied wall enhancement pattern that occurs. Here is another case. Um, this is the same patient with the conventional angiogram. You can actually see the major vascular supplying to it. But then the image to the right, you can actually see where in the late arterial phase, where the paraganglioma, in actual fact, this is where it starts to enhance mostly. So that's why whenever we do carotid CTA, even in tumors, when we scan from top to bottom, but we do our imaging from the circle of Willis, we get to see these late arterial enhancing lesions, 
instead of having multiple runs, so you do pre arterial venous, then we can just do an arterial phase. You won't need the venous and you won't need the pre contrast. We're also going to look at two common types of tumors. You have the schwannoma and then you have a neurofibroma. A schwannoma is when you have a large swelling of one of the nerve sheets internally, whereas a neurofibroma, all of them swell up almost equally and you get this large bundle or ball. So if you have a look here on CT, the image to your left where you have the white circle, you can see the internal carotid artery beautifully filled. Okay, but then if you look to the right side, we can see the white arrows with the arrowheads. There is displacement of the tumors and there is heterogeneous filling. If you look at the images to the right, these are MRI sequences and is a T2 weighted, one with and one without fat suppression. And you can actually see it's a well circumscribed border and definitely it's nerve related, not vascular related. Whereas if we look at something like this, which is a neurofibroma, the image to your left, you can actually see there is not much enhancement because all of the nerve sheaths are, are completely hypertrophied. So you're not getting a lot of blood flow into that area, but you can also see the arterial and vein, veins that have been completely pushed aside, but there is enhancement. Whereas if you look at the image to the right, again, this is another case of a neurofibroma and this happens quite a lot, especially at the angle of the mandible. So remember, carotid CTA is not just about looking at the vasculature. We have infections, we have dissections, we have ulcerated plaques, we have fibrous uh, sheaths, uh, which is the cobs, carotid arteries, which are causing thrombosis or transient ischemic attacks. We also have tumors that are filling like paragangliomas, as well as nerve-based tumors such as schwannomas and neurofibromas. So in this lecture, We've looked at aneurysms, ulcerated plaques, dissection, fibromuscular dysplasia, stroke, arterial venous malformations, especially in the different areas, and tumors. So thank you very much for listening to this three lecture series. Don't forget, we are putting together the ultimate coronary CTA course. We will look at anatomy of the cardiac tissue as well as the coronary arteries. We will go through protocol optimization, scanning techniques, tips and tricks, contrast media delivery protocols, iodinated contrast media flow rates. We'll look at pathology, bypass graft imaging. More important, we'll look at image reconstruction, which techniques are the best to use for which pathologies and how to display your information. We will always teach you what others don't. So please stay with us at mdct.thinkific.com. But also we have our flagship website. We have so much more lectures that we have as well on www.mdct.com.au. Thank you all very much for being a part of this ECG course on interpretation and being able to fix and salvage poor scans and please make sure you share us on facebook instagram twitter and the more you share the more we see you never know we'll be reaching out to you for amazing discounts and even free deals for our loyal customers at mdct so thank you all very much really appreciate the help and support you've been giving to this platform and all of our money is invested back into this education as well as to non-profit organizations to help those in need So this brings us to the end of the nine part series. I'm glad you enjoyed this lecture series. Please share this on your social media accounts and don't forget to always visit www.mdct.com.au for more lectures, free information and conferences that we run around the world. Once again, I, Dr. Shabel Saadi, I'm very grateful to you for investing your time and your money into this education resource and I look forward to receiving your reviews and more importantly sharing your feelings on how you felt after doing this course if it added to your clinical practice in your clinical center around the world.